Pitch black. And blue. And dead. All over. Hello, and welcome back to Mix Presents Sound for Film Awards season. I'm Tom Kenny, the editor of Mix, and we're here to talk about The Batman, uh, released by Warner Brothers, I believe March 1st, 2022. Joined by re-recording mixer Andy Nelson, supervising sound editor, sound designer, re-recording mixer Will Files, and supervising sound editor Doug Murray. Thank you, gentlemen, for coming along. Um, to kick it off, I just sort of, I'm always interested in how sound designers deal with a legacy film of sorts. And I don't mean that this has been done before, but Batman has been done before. Uh, Doug, when you go into a new version, do you think Blank Slate or how does it work? Well, in this case, because it was a Matt Reeves film, we we knew it would be something new and fresh and different. Uh, I can tell you that I watched a lot of Batman movies before I started working on it just to get a sense of the vibe. Um, And I found wonderful things in all of them, but we didn't take the solutions that they had made for our own movie. We came up with our own solutions. I'm sure everybody does that on movies like this. We didn't recycle any old sounds or, um, you know, treatments for voices and things like that. We, we came up with a whole new palette of things uh, that, new Batmobile, the new voice of the new star playing Batman and so on. They, they all had to require, they all required different uh, treatments and approaches. And Matt wanted it to be very different in feel from the previous Batmans. Yeah, I think it's probably safe to say that we were more influenced by the movies of the 70s, especially like the Francis Coppola films, like, you know, The Godfather, The Conversation, movies like The French Connection. You know, those those are the movies that we were talking about as we were making the film, much more than any other Batman world. Well, one of the things about Batman, I mean, it's it, it certainly unique here is the voice. I mean, when you have that narration, you have a, both the speaking voice of Batman in the field uh, and we opened with a dark look at Gotham. I mean, Andy, do you want to how you shape that voice and how you spend time with establishing it? It was all Rob, Rob Pattinson. I mean, his voice, you know, he, he, he developed that voice, got into the character and, and remarkably easily and quickly because he just, he just spent enough time sort of preparing for it. And so um, it, it was really about preserving that and making sure that it, it was able to come through clearly because it was up against an awful lot of elements at times. I mean, this film is uh, this film is draped in atmosphere and and um, uh, the sense that he had to always be heard and dominate, but often from a very internal point of view, um, because you know he he was clearly uncomfortable. Um, in, in many ways, you know, that's why the drifter was such a, an interesting role for him in the sense of, you know, he could just fit in and not be seen. And so I think his voice was a reflection of that. And that, that really all came from, from Matt and Rob, to be honest. It was about protecting it more than anything. Yeah. You know, our production mixer, Stuart, did such an amazing job recording the, the sound on set. He, he even had multiple microphones sewn into uh, the bat suit itself. And even on the mix, I remember Matt, was so allergic to anything that sounded even faintly of artifice when it came to Rob's voice. So sometimes Matt would even call out, can we hear, you know, a different mic on this just so it doesn't sound like we're adding anything to it. Um, So so it was often about even mic choices to sound as, as sort of neutral and not put on. Wow. In the performance, that's, I, I would have guessed some treatment because it's outstanding and it's consistent. He, uh, he had a, uh, an ability to kind of drop his voice down. He couldn't like shout or talk loudly with that low voice that he found, but he could 
keep it going consistently. And it was the, it was hard for him to get back into it doing ADR because he hadn't done it for quite a while since we, the show, the shoot, when we had to re-record the voiceover. Um, and it took him a day just to get back to the, the tone of the timbre. Well, one other thing comment about that, let's go to, I mean, gizmos, weapons, vehicles, uh, we expect all of them, and we have a new take on all of them. I mean, even starting with uh, the motorcycles, before we get to the famous Batmobile, uh, tell me about the motorcycles. We got Catwoman, and uh, he races around in the dark and wet city streets. Can you tell me about vehicles? He's uh, he's He has a cafe racer type uh, motorcycle. Um, and luckily, one of our sound designers, uh, our friend Craig Hennigan, is a big motorcycle guy, and he happens to have a very similar bike. So... Um, Craig spent a Saturday afternoon strapping microphones on his bike and driving all over LA, uh, you know, trying to basically recreate what, what Rob was doing on the bike. Um, and so most of what you're hearing there is, uh, is what Craig recorded. And one cool thing that he did was he put a, um, an ambisonic mic right on the, on the bike with him. And so when we were, you know, obviously we had lots of shots that, you know, were from the outside perspective, but then we had a lot of shots where we were right there with him on, you know, on the cameras, on the bike. And so we were able to use that ambisonic and really kind of feel like we're right there with him. And it had a, it had a really interesting effect, even played low because we, we weren't really, other than some of the buys, we were, we were kind of trying to stay in his head as much as possible through that early section of the film. Um, but you still get that sense of it kind of being around you in that interesting way that ambisonics capture. No, they're fun. And the, the bands are chasing through a city, wet, dark, wet city streets. It's a, it's a lot of fun. Well, the most thing was actually doing the, the, the scenes where him and Catwoman were, were jockeying for position because really it was, it was almost, I think Matt saw it as almost a flirtation. Uh, you know, in the performance of the bikes where, you know, they'd, they'd sort of pull ahead of each other. And uh, so trying to differentiate their bikes and try to give them a character that felt like almost expressive. Well, we're going to stick with you here a second because the Batmobile, uh, I've heard other sound designers rave about your Batmobile. So uh, did Craig have fast cars too that he drives around LA or how does that work? <laughs> uh, well, he does have a lot of fast cars to drive around LA. Um, the, the Batmobile was a, a real, uh, it was a lot of exploration. It took us a long time to, to figure out exactly what the Batmobile was going to sound like. Um, you know, most of our conversations with Matt about anything start with the idea of how do we want the audience to feel about whatever we're seeing and experiencing. And he made it really clear from an early point that he wanted the Batmobile to feel as if Bruce had built it to intimidate. You know, it's not just to be fast. It's not just high performance. It's it's actually meant to look and sound intimidating so that when you turn it on in a dark alleyway, um, you know, everyone turns around and goes, what the hell is that? And so it really had to have the same effect to the audience. You know, you had to really say, like, is that a is that a banshee? You know, like, what is that? Um, and at the same time, it also had to be plausible that once you figured out it was a, a machine, that it, you know, was plausibly a car. Um, so there's there's really three elements to the Batmobile. There's the um, the engine, which is uh, we we literally tested like twelve different engines, different types. You know, Hemi's, V8s, V12s, V10s, V6s, supercharged, turbocharged, naturally aspirated. You know, you name it. Um, and what we ended up with was um, we found that the kind of gnarliest one was this uh, this seventies era Ford V8 which had a specific firing order, which gave it this kind of weird, lopey um, kind of cadence to it. And it just had a, had a little more snarl than all the other ones did. So we uh, went out to the desert with John Fasal and we recorded this um, – the 70s era Ford out on the airstrip and, uh, you know, have, hang, having it do all kinds of crazy stuff. So there's the there's the engine, there's the uh, the rocket burner, and then there's this uh, the turbine sound. And the, the, the turbine sound was something that was really eluding me because that's the thing that kind of has the most emotional uh, character, especially that kind of howl that it does. Um, so that was something that I kind of stumbled on after trying a whole bunch of different things. I, I was working on something else and I – and I heard this, I was going through my library and I heard this little, very short piece of a bottle rocket. It was like a little one second kind of thing, but it had this kind of rippy 
distorted howl to it that I was like, there's something there that's that's interesting. But how the hell am I going to turn this into, you know, it needs to be a 30 second wind up basically, because it's functioning almost as music. It's like a big, you know, tension builder. Um, so I remembered that years ago I had, I had found this piece of software called Paul stretch and it's basically an algorithm that can take a sound and stretch it out by like a hundred times longer. You can take a, a one second sound and make it two minutes long. And it has this way of, um, it's sort of, it keeps the essence of the sound, but it, it does sort of smear it across time. So it's not really good for transients and things like that, but it's great for things like a howl. So um, I took this little one second mirror and I turned it into what you hear in the movie, which is, you know, this really long kind of intense uh, howling shriek. Um, and so that's the, the, really, if you want to know the secret of the Batmobile, it's literally just a bottle rock. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow appropriate. Uh, in yeah. that sense. Um, and then these vehicles, though, they don't sit still. They don't just sit in the alley waiting for the drug deal to go down. They, uh, they engage in chases. Doug, um, it, it, engaging and supervising a, a, a chase sequence like we have when he takes on the penguin. I know certainly will. You must be heavily involved in that. But your role is sort of constructing this uh, long and you know, fast chasing through uh, crashes and fires and everything. How does this begin? How do you work on that? Uh, well, I would say that it was a very long and complicated process. So we we first had to figure out what is happening because while we were working on it, the scene was evolving visually. And so there was a lot of people telling us what we were see, supposed to be seeing, but we didn't actually see it for the first several months. So while Will was figuring out what the engines should be, we were all trying to figure out, and then what are they actually doing? So it, it, there was a, I think Matt actually reworked some of the cha uh, the uh, sequence, you know, coming up with slightly different, uh, clearer ways to show what was happening towards the end of the chase scene. And so, uh, I mean, I really, you, I have to probably pass this back over to Will because I had we. What was really fun about this was we all took a stab at it in the earlier days. And we all contributed something uh, to the ch chase scene, and it was great fun. And then as the visual effects got closer and closer to being finished, Will and Chris Terhoon did most of the were, – were kind of taking over most of the work. Lee Gilmore also contributed a lot. And we – anyway, there was so many elements. There was the rain and the, you know, the tires. The There were a few – voices of the actors in the cars, uh, which many of which were quite buried under a lot of noise. So there's a certain amount of work to dig them out because um, there's a lot of practical, it was all practical voices on the set. They were, I think we just added some breaths and reactions, uh, but otherwise the lines that you hear were recorded in cars moving fast on streets. Um, but I'll, Will, Will uh, I think you can talk a little bit more about some of the complexities of editing that scene together. Well, there was, you know, as much we're, we're, as much sound is in the final product. There's there's ten times more sound that we put in and took out and <laughs> threw away. Um, for example, Doug did this amazing um, sort of music concrete kind of like, uh, you know, making music with with real sounds with found sounds, and he did a, a pass for the whole for the whole scene for Matt to hear and just sort of react to as an idea. And, you know, that's a, that's an example of the kind of thing that we, we tried a lot of things that were out of the box that we wouldn't normally do on most films. Cause Matt is, is not only receptive to it, but also kind of demands it. I mean, you know, Matt is really always looking for how do we, how do we make a different choice here than, you know, you might be tempted to make normally. Um, so <clears throat> I would say that, Really, the the Batmobile scene is is mostly a result of lots of trial and error, including in the mix. I mean, Andy and I spent you know days figuring out even from moment to moment, you know, well, so what's the thing that's needs to be featured here? Is it a, is it a music thing? And it was literally you know bar by bar, shot by shot, trying to figure it out. Yeah, and and you know it's really interesting because when you do a sequence like that, 
and you present the music to it, there's always that concern when initially of how thick and how dense the music might be, how much real estate it's going to use up. Um, because it's hard to play music low. You know, it's got to be, it's designed to be there. But Michael Giacchino, who of course is a long-term collaborator with Matt Reeves, did an amazing job because the music in the film is is incredibly beautiful. I mean, he wrote a, a suite before it was shot and based on his feelings from the script and his discussions with Matt. And and Matt fell in love with it, rightly so. And, and so in a way it had this lovely... Um, the feel of going through the movie, it wasn't a question of fitting this music to a film. It was about it evolving equally at the same time, musically and, and, and editing. So then you come to a scene like The Chase, very different type of sound, of course, but it's, it, he, he did it in a very percussive style, what we normally do. Will and I have done a few of these in the past. You know, we go through and we'll look for the corners where the music is changing tempo or certain beats are hitting certain ways. And that's what we'll try and make sure we can clarify. But in general, it's, a, it's just a dance that we do between the, 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 the dialogue, the music, and the effects. And um, it, uh, I think we were all pretty happy with this sequence when, when we ended up with it. It took a while, but it, um, again, a lot of that was down to how Michael had orchestrated and designed the music. We only have a couple of minutes left, but I do want to talk about the destruction of Gotham Garden. <laughs> and since we, we build to a climax where with the spoiler alert, the Riddler strikes from jail. Um, and, and things go to hell and you collapse a building. And this is about as, you know, it, as destructive as a city can get. I mean, the final scenes there what, starts with snipers and ends with floods. That was one of the hardest scenes to, to do. I'm getting PTSD just thinking about it. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> the, the thing that's hard about that scene is we, we really had to, go through it with Matt on the, on the mix stage. We went through, you know, again, moment by moment and orchestrated exactly what we wanted to hear. So there's not a lot of, nothing's really random in that, in that whole sequence, maybe in the whole film, there's not a lot of just things that are there because of whatever They're there because of a reason. And um, Matt really wanted to make sure that we were weaving this story that he was, I think, afraid that it needed some help, uh, you know, with the audience understanding that what Batman was seeing and what he was paying attention to. Um, because of course, you know, when we're doing the mix, the visual effects aren't quite done. You know, they ended up looking great, but he was really concerned that the audience would understand he's seeing this, this danger that the crowd is going to be in because they're in the water. There's this high voltage electricity that could kill them all. And so he ends up, you know, potentially sacrificing himself to save them. Um, and then, of course, you know, you have all the other chaos happening with the water bursting in this, into the building and with the bombs going off and all this other horrible stuff. But we, you know, we wanted it to feel big and massive, but we also didn't want it to feel like just a disaster film. You know, it needed to still feel like um, this was all being experienced through, you know, largely through Bruce's point of view, um, but, you know, or through the point of view of the the people in in the place. So there was a lot of perspective played on everything. There's very little, there's a lot of detail, but everything sort of played, you know, almost, you know, at a hundred yards um, kind of just uh, because we didn't want it to be a disaster. You know, it's not, as, it's not a disaster film. It's, it's a horrible thing to to these people, but it's not a disaster film. That makes total sense though, because you are, he's in it. I mean, that's the perspective the audience have is he's in the middle of this, still living through it. He's not watching it from afar. Andy, you've mixed a lot of big films, uh, big scenes in big films. Uh, what do you say about this one? Listening to Will, then it's absolutely right because I think the the, the we did take a long time doing this sequence, but the, the it was always about the intent. It wasn't about creating a spectacle for spectacle's sake. It had to be the intent, and the intent was constantly being switched around depending on what we were watching or looking at. And again, going back to the music, there was a po point in time when the music had to take over and dominate because that was exactly what Batman was feeling and going through in this, as Will put it, this sort of possible sacrifice that he was he was making. So um, all big scenes are complex like that, and they do take a while to sort out. And But I think you've always got to go back to what I always try and do is go back to what's the purpose of every single shot. That's the only way to make sense of a scene like that is you have to analyze what every shot is supposed to be telling us 
And therefore, how do we communicate that with sound, be it sound effects, crowds, or music? And, and I think that's what we did. And Matt is an extraordinary director to work with because he will sit with us and really pick through every detail with us and help us guide, you know, with his intent. And um, I, that's, that's my take on, on how you handle a scene like that. So I would say that Matt's focus here in that scene towards the end when the water's bursting in and he's just beaten this guy almost to death is that the character of Batman must have a realization, a change of heart, a kind of a dawning of some sort of wisdom that maybe his approach wasn't working so well in the past. And now he needs to take a new angle going forward. And that has to be, Matt was desperately wanting the audience to understand that that was the case. And there is no word. Nothing is telling you that in words. So it's all in the music and in the sound and in obviously in the performance. But it's, uh, it's, that is the moment in the film that I think Will was having PTSD about because we literally worked on that 20 seconds for like three days in the mix. As we, as we tried to get the angle on it, and we finally did. I think we were all very happy with it in the end. Every single day we would put that reel up to watch it, we would see more and more evolved visual effects shots. And that helped tremendously once you really started to see the images properly. Well, it's a fantastic movie, gentlemen. And I wish, I mean, we could talk about Catwoman's Foley. We could go on and on about a thousand things here. I mean, there's so much of this movie, and yet it's so consistently itself all the way through. And I uh, I applaud you. And I wish you luck during the award season here. Uh, all of you listening, go out thank and you, vote. Uh, and uh, thank you, gentlemen.